uh, one of the things we did is we changed the business model to from a from this the sales concept to a software as a service business, and that allowed us to actually generate 70% gross margins. We'll talk a little bit about our financials later. Uh, I took the company private in 2004. I actually borrowed $20 million from three well-known institution, institutions, uh, Trinity Ventures out of Menlo Park, California, InterSouth Partners here in the, in the area, and River Cities out of Cincinnati, Ohio. I borrowed the money from these folks because I actually happened to know them. I had known them for a number of years, and I said to them, I want to borrow $20 million to buy a public company. You can imagine I got a lot of funny looks, but in the end, they actually gave me the $20 million. And for that $20 million, I used to go out and actually buy the public shares from the public shareholders and take the company off the public markets and become private. Uh, and then when we did the IPO that we just finished, that IPO process was a way for me to generate capital to be able to begin to pay back those investors for, make, for allowing me to make that purchase. Uh, we've changed the culture of the company from the concept of it's all about the vision to the idea that it's all about our customers, shareholders, and employees. And the order of that is actually very important. Customers, shareholders, and employees. We don't exist at SideQuest if it's not for our customers, number one. Two, we do not exist as a company if it's not for our employees, or for our shareholders, because they give us the capital and we work for their return. And the third is for our employees. Uh, the last is uh, we have a new culture which is different, and again, we'll talk about that. So a little bit about what we do. We're an on-demand provider. We're a software-as-a-service company. We help organizations buy and track their indirect goods and services that they purchase. What are indirect goods and services? Computer equipment, office supplies, temporary labor, food service, uh, laboratory supplies, anything a university needs to operate, they use our software to purchase and track. What does our software do? You can best describe it as like four simple, four simple analogies. We allow each of our customers to have their own Amazon.com environment that's based up of the suppliers that they choose to buy from. So the faculty inside that university can see these are the office supplies the purchasing department wants to buy. These are the lab supplies that my purch the purchasing department wants to buy. So we're a little bit like Amazon.com. We're a little bit like Quicken because our clients want to be able to know how much they bought, who they bought it from, how much did they pay for it. So think of our technology as a little bit like Quicken. The third piece is it's a little bit like SaaS. We have business intelligence, so we help our clients figure out how much am I paying for my pencils? Am I paying too much? Could if I bought, if I bought in larger quantities, could I buy a lower price? And then the last thing is think of us as Federal Express. We help them communicate electronically with their suppliers. We, send, we, we integrate through our hub and spoke concept. We allow them to do, it, do invoicing, billing, receiving, and it's all done electronically through our technology. So that's effectively what we do. We go to market based that we sell into four basic vertical markets, higher education, life science, healthcare, and state and local government. To give you some notion of who uses our technology, uh, Duke uses us, East Carolina University, a lot of the Florida schools, the entire uh, system of the Tennessee schools use us, state of Georgia. State of Georgia is 14th largest economy in the world, and they buy everything through our technology. They'll process over $2 billion this year alone through, through our platform. Um, unfortunately, NC State is not a client today, but we're gonna, one day we're going to change that. Uh, our clients, uh, we deliver it as a software as a service, so it's a multi-tenant single instance. It runs on our service and RTP. Uh, our clients typically sign long-term multi-year agreements. Uh, we've got a great track record. Uh, SciQuest as a company has been able to demonstrate over 20 quarters of consecutive top line revenue growth. Uh, and that was one of the key reasons why we were able to go public in this market is that we've got a very good financial record. Um, to give you some idea, we'll do about 30, we did $36 million in revenue in 2009, generated about 6.7 million of free cash flow, and we're, today we're about 165 customers, to give you some notion of it. Uh, some of the founding principles of how we run our business is really driven by three things, customer focus, vertical intimacy, and financial stewardship. These are the three pieces that we talk about and we focus on, and in fact, when we took the company public, this was one of the slides that I actually walked all of the potential investors through, is this is how we run and see our business. So that's a little bit about the history. SciQuest has been through a very, very uh, torturous road, but it is in a position today where it's growing and it's actually doing very well. So let me talk about some leadership misconceptions that I've learned over my, my, my many years of working. Culture. 
Culture is a term that a lot of people talk about. When you talk to business leaders and you ask them, they, they describe their culture. This is how we as an organization talk. This is how we as an organization operate. I believe that's an important concept, but it's actually a byproduct of something. And culture is a tangible result of what I believe is leadership. Good leadership creates culture. Bad leadership creates bad culture. And in fact, when I walked into SideQuest, they spent a lot of time talking about their culture, when actually they should have been talking about their leadership. The leadership wasn't bad. I'm not criticizing it. It was just, it was an output of the leadership. And so that's why we're going to talk about leadership as we go through the discussion going forward. The other thing that people confuse is leadership and management are the same thing. So I would suggest to you they're not. Management is how you organize, how you do things. Leadership is how you inspire, how you, treat, how you teach people to operate and act. Management is a skill that you can teach in the classroom. Leadership is more difficult. It's intangible. I'm not saying you can't teach it, but it's a different type of skill. And a lot of times people confuse the two. I meet a lot of young people coming out of school, and I'll say to them, so tell me about, tell me about your leadership. And what they will explain to me is a lot of the things they learned in management. And it's actually, again, very different. So let's talk about leadership. Leadership, in my mind, one of the misconceptions that I thought that I learned very early on is leadership is a process. Leadership is a process. It's something that you do. Hmm. I think that's wrong. Let me explain what I think it is. Leadership is a behavior. A process is something you can replicate. But you, do, you can do it and choose not to do it. Leadership is a behavior, and it's a behavior you have to do all the time. What do I mean by this? Well, you lead others by what you do, not what you say. You lead by what you do, not what you say. So we can have a document. In fact, we have a document inside our company called our customer commitment statement. We teach all new employees to that. Now, is that leading them to make the right decisions when I have a client that has a problem? No. The way, I tr the way I lead them to it is I demonstrate that behavior. So when a client's unhappy, I take responsibility. I apologize to the client. Or someone on my management team takes responsibility. It's the behavior. It's not the process. It's not something you do once in a while. It's something you do all the time. And you show people how to do it by acting it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I will tell you the most important time as a leader you can lead is when you're in the break room getting a cup of coffee. And actually, it's interesting is people that are starting to think about leadership go, it's the company meetings. It's when you stand up and address the employees. I think that's a fallacy. The way I lead is day in and day out. When I'm getting a cup of coffee and I can talk to an employee and I can ask them, What's going on? How's that customer doing? Are we doing this? What are we doing? How are we doing this? That's the way I can lead, and that's the way my management team leads, day in and day out. It's the informal interactions that are much more powerful than the big presentations. The presentations come and go. People forget. It's the day in and day out pieces that are really very meaningful. The other thing that I think is important is transparency is the vehicle, trust is the key. Transparency is the vehicle, trust is the key. To be a good leader, you have to be transparent. People have to understand why you do things. So let me, ta let me take a, tell you a story. When I walked into SciQuest in 2001, and I knew we were going to downsize the business, I met with the employees. And I, the first thing, the first company meeting, I remember it was in March, was I stood in front of the entire employee base, which was about 500 people, and I showed them product line profitability. Every product in the company, we worked real hard for days to try to come up with what we could come up, what we could uh, come as close as to product line profitability analysis as possible. And I stood in front of the employees and I showed them this product was going to generate seven million dollars of revenue, and its cost was thirty-six million dollars. That was the first time those employees had ever seen that before. And so the minute I put that data in front of them, it was interesting. First off, when I put the data up, everybody gasped because they were like. You mean my product is losing that amount of money? But then once I had that transparency, then when I said, and you know what we're going to do? We're going to have to downsize the business because that can't continue. People understood why we were downsizing the business. Prior to that, they would have been, well, why are you doing this? It doesn't make sense. So transparency was the key in enabling us. And I will tell you, we laid off over 400 employees. We were not sued by anyone. 
We had no legal action against us by, from any of the people we cut loose. And the reason for that is I believe it's because of the transparency that we weren't able to show everyone. I will tell you, one of our biggest challenges right now as a, as a company is transparency is a challenge because being public, we can't talk about things until we do our earnings announcements. So for example, I, I, we're not announcing our financial results at SideQuest until Monday next week at five o'clock. And I can't talk to the employees about, here's what's going on well, here's what we sold, here's what didn't happen. I can't do that till after the end of the quarter. And so I've lost the opportunity to demonstrate transparency to the employees. And that's something that actually we're trying to figure out. How do we give them more transparency still within working in this world of Reg, Reg FD and Sarbanes-Oxley and those things? Uh, the other last piece to talk about is it must be continual. It cannot be periodic. You have to do it all the time. Leading, again, you lead when you're in the break room, when you're standing in line getting food at one of our company meetings or our company lunches, that's when you're leading. You can't pick and choose. I can't choose to be a leader at, at half of the day and the other half of the day I can't choose to say, well, listen, I don't really want to talk to anybody. I don't really want to engage with the employees. You have to do it all the time. You have to be transparent and they have to trust you because if they don't trust you and they can't see what you're doing, they won't follow you. Second misconception, and this is one that I learned from GE. Um, I was actually GE's youngest corporate treasurer at the age of 27. Uh, I ran GE's foreign exchange portfolio for their plastics business group. And the reason I got promoted was anytime somebody would ask me a question, I always had an answer for them. Always had the answer, right? May not have been the perfect answer, but I always had an answer. And so I was taught at a very young age if I have an answer, I'm gonna get promoted, right? Because I got promoted and I kept getting moved up because I always had the answer. And I didn't realize that to be a really good leader, you don't need to have the answer. You actually have to be ready with the question. Good leaders, in my mind, are, question, are people that ask questions, not people that have answers. Hmm. Let's think about that for a second. Why? Well. Actually, one of the things I learned is when, you, when someone comes to me with an idea, my, your natural reaction is, oh, well, that's a good idea, or that's a bad idea, right? I've learned that by when someone comes up to even a meeting or anywhere, and they say, I've got this idea, the first thing I do is ask them a question, and it allows me to learn more about the problem or the issue. If I give them an answer right when they ask me a question, I've shut down all dialogue. I've lost the opportunity to learn. I've lost the opportunity to engage. But starting with questions actually draws that person in to tell me more. If they tell you an answer, if they tell you something and you don't understand it and you say no, it may have been a really good idea. You just, I just didn't understand it. So questions allow you to, to learn. Questions also allow for conflict. Okay, so let me tell you, when I, when I started at GE, I had a really hard boss, a very tough guy. And what he would do is he would take a presentation. If he didn't like it, he would tear it up and he'd say, go back and work on it and come back and see me again. All right? Wow. You didn't really want to go see him very often. I learned a lot. It taught me a lot of good skills. I got really good at checking my math and all sorts of things. But I never really, I never, I never learned from him. I never was able to build a relationship. By, ha by asking questions, you can actually have conflict, you can have disagreement, but it's done in a very polite, respectful way. Someone comes in and says, I think we should raise prices by 100%. What I wanna say is that's a dumb idea, right? So what I do say is, hmm, interesting. Why do you think we should? Right? So, and then I can start asking questions. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? What about this income? What about this impact? And that way, I can actually disagree with the person, but I can do it in a very non-confrontational, a very respectful way, rather than saying, dumb idea, tear it up, go back and think about it, and come back and see me again. So questions allow for conflict in a very safe way. They also allow you to send a message without embarrassment. Somebody brings me a piece of work, and, I don't, and it's, it's not well done, it's not complete, I can ask questions. What about this? Have you thought about that? Why does it do this? Why does it say that? And after about five minutes, the person realizes, hmm, maybe I don't, don't understand this problem really well. So they go away and they work on it and they come back. If that person would have come in and I said, That's a, this is horrible work, get out of my office, how long before you think they'll come back and talk to me? Or anyone else on my management team? A long time. 
And it's hard to lead when you're, when you're not connected to people. You have to be out there talking to them. You have to encourage them. So questions allow you to send messages. The other thing is there's a theory that says if you're a leader and you're asking for input and you're asking questions, you're losing power. And we'll talk a little bit about power in a little bit. But I believe actually asking questions gives you power, gives you authority. It's a way to build your power in the position rather than losing it. And it, and it actually does not make a leader weak. Leaders are afraid of saying, hmm, I don't know the answer to that. They're afraid, oh, people aren't going to trust me. They're not going to follow you. But if we believe our original premise of a, a leader has to be transparent and have trust, you know what? If you don't know the answer, you got to say the answer. I don't know. We got to think about it. And I have open meetings with our company. I get questions and answers. And there are times I get questions and I go, you know, that's a really good question. We don't know the answer to that. Because by the way, if I say, well, we've got the answer, but we don't want to share it with you, or you know, we're not ready to talk about it, the employees are smart. They'll go, hmm, they don't really know what they're doing. They just don't want to admit it. People are smart. So be honest. OK, a leader needs to be a great speaker. Third misconception. A leader needs to be a great speaker, but an even better listener. Listening is a completely underrated skill. And I would suggest you, if you want to learn one good skill in college, that's to be a really, really good listener. People are always talking. If you sit and listen, you can learn a lot just by sitting there and listening. Don't even have to say anything. Especially in job interviews, that's usually what I do. People come in an interview, and I go, hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Tell me a little bit about yourself. And then I sit there. You'd be amazed what people will tell you. When you sit there, you're not, not rude, polite, interesting, hmm, interesting. They'll do the whole interview themselves, and they'll tell you a lot of things that you never would have thought to ask. But being a good listener, so let's talk about why. Well, these are some of the sayings that I use in the company quite a bit. Seek to understand, then be understood. Listen to the other person first before you try to make your point. Because you know what? If you allow them to talk first, you'll learn a lot. You will gain power from the process, and you'll probably be educated. Seek to understand, then be understood. People's natural bias is, I can't wait to tell you, and you have to listen to me first. And guess what? That person's bias is, I can't wait to tell you, and so you're too busy talking to each other because you want to be first, and nobody really listens. Instead of telling, listen to understand, understand to empathize, empathize to change. This is what I did when I walked into the original SideQuest business. I did not walk in on day one and say, this company is really a mess. It's screwed up. What I did was, hmm, I'm here to learn about it. And I spent a lot of time listening, and I was trying to understand why they had built the business the way they had. They were very smart people that built that company. It had problems, and we're not, we're, I'm not denying that. But what I wanted to understand what they were doing, once I could empathize why they made those decisions, and I could understand why they were trying to do the things they were doing, then I could begin to think about how I to change it. But if I walked in on day one and said, this is all wrong, we're going to do this, and I hadn't done those two pieces, I would not have been able to get those people to follow me. I will tell you, uh, probably I have 30 people in the company today that predate me inside of SideQuest. They were there hired before I got there, and they're still with us today. They, just, they stayed through the good and the bad. And that was because we focused, I focused a lot of time on the empathy, not the change piece. We did a lot of change. I don't, want to disagree, don't, I don't want to miss that. At the center of every joke is a nugget of truth. This is a quote from Ben Franklin. The center, the, the, the center of every joke is a nugget of truth. And you find that with a lot of people, because a lot of times people want to talk about things that are uncomfortable. And the way they talk about it is they joke about it. Great example with my kids. I have a 13 and a 15-year-old. My 15-year-old's like, ha, 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 that Latin test. Oh, man, I never want to touch Latin again. That's a stupid subject. Ha, ha, no one can pass Latin. Laugh, laugh. And by the way, he's a 15-year-old boy, so he doesn't talk a lot. So I'm like, hmm. So there's a nugget of truth. And what he's telling me is, I'm having problems in Latin. I'm struggling with the class. But it's presented to me in a lot. Because what's his position? Does he want to walk in and say, hey, Dad, I think I may flunk Latin? That's not a conversation you want to have with your dad, right? But kind of joking about it, that's his way of putting the issue out. So if you understand that people joke about things that they're struggling with, it allows you to learn what's going on, and then therefore allows you to manage and lead around those problems. Because guess what? The, 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 the success of building a company is solving problems. 
that's all I do, and that's all our management team does every day. We're solving problems. That's how you build a great company. And if you got it, you got to get people to tell you what the problems are. And the last is most people can listen. This is me primarily. Uh, I can listen and think faster than I can talk and think. So if I keep my mouth shut and I listen and think, I can learn a lot and I can actually process quicker than if I'm running my mouth and trying to think. I'm single-threaded. <laughs> mouth talks and then the brain thinks. So if I'm listening and not talking, I can process more. Okay, misconception four. Great ideas come from debate and conflict. You've heard this a lot. We really want to get in there and argue about what's the best idea. I, agree, I believe that's wrong. Great ideas come from open, constructive, and positive discussions driven by constructive questions. Not cross-examinations, not forcing people to defend their position, but again, going back to the, hmm, why do you think that? Why should we do this? Why should we not do that? One of my favorite questions is, hmm, so why do you think I should say, I should say yes to this? Why do you think I should say no to this? And ask the person for their thoughts. You learn a lot. So some ideas about this. Facilitator leaders, I believe, are more powerful than directive style leaders. Leaders that say, you got to go do this, they, you, that works for a while, but it doesn't work long time, but long term. Um, conflict creates situations where people and ideas become positions. If you force someone to argue a position over and over again, it becomes part of their, part of their psyche and therefore it becomes very difficult for them to change or to think of a different way of the solution. But by asking and keeping the idea more in the center of the table and, for, and not forcing people to take sides, you will find you will get consensus and get answers easier and quicker and you will get more buy-in from the group rather than if you are directive. Uh, everyone contributes and therefore buys into the idea. And the key thing about this last one is if you get people involved in the decision-making process, so let's say we decide we want to launch a new product and we get together as a group and we talk about it and we talk about this product's going to have these features and this price and we go through that whole discussion and six weeks later we discover the market doesn't like that, what, that solution we came up with. If we told them, go do this, in six weeks when that doesn't work, what do they do? Hmm. So they got to come back and they got to ask, tell me, what's the answer? What should I do? Versus if they've been part of the decision-making process, they understand what you're trying to accomplish, they can actually course correct. And a lot of times they will actually come up with the answer themselves and you as a leader never need to get back involved in it if they've been part of the original idea. Last two, leadership, uh, leader mandates change. I agree, I, I believe that's wrong. You coax. Uh, you can do it in, in times of crisis when the world's falling around. You can say we have to do this. Most of the times in periods of growth or in stagnation, you have to coax change. And that is really getting it to come from the bottom up rather than the top down. Uh, why? Well, CEOs are used to being direct. Tell is a normal behavior that you find. I believe ask is much more effective. I spend a lot of time asking people for their ideas, asking them what they think we should do, not telling them. Uh, focus on positive reinforcement, not negative. Uh, my son plays football. His football coach yells at him every week. First two weeks of practice, he's a fearful of the coach. By about the third week, he's kind of like, yeah, he, are, he yells a lot. We just ignore him. That's not effective. It works a little bit. It doesn't work long term. So asking, positive reinforcement, it works, is, is the power here. And the removal of stress in a situation, I believe, uh, yields much better results than the addition of stress. When we're having a tough sales quarter or when something, technology's not working, I'm not out telling the people, you've got to fix this. If it doesn't, it's going to take the company down. What I say to them is, you know, you'll figure it out. I've got a lot of faith in you. You're smart. I want to take stress out of the equation. Because if I can get them to be less stressful, they actually will think clearer, more rationally, and you get a better outcome than constantly turning the grades, turning the screws. Less stress is better than more stress. Now, by the way, there are times you need to put stress on people when they're not paying attention. Right? There are times, but it's little, not a lot. Uh, number six, a leader needs to be tough. They set a standard. They need to maintain power and authority. I think that's wrong. I think the keys are if a leader needs to demonstrate the correct use, the correct use of respect, feedback, power, and anger. What do I mean by that? Respect, give it unconditionally. Give it out all the time. Show respect to everybody in the business. Do, as a leader, you cannot forget I, my life is the same as everybody else that works for me. I just have a different title. 
They all have kids, they have mortgages, they've got wives or spouses. And the minute you begin to, to forget that and separate yourself, people will not follow you. So always give respect. And the, when, you, the, when you get it, when you give it, you will always get it back. Feedback. Uh, feedback is one of the get things we talk a lot about inside the company. If people are willing to give you feedback, treat it as a gift. You may not have to agree with it. You may not think it's right. But feedback is a very key piece. When I finish today, I'm going to ask this fine gentleman for feedback. And I'm going to say, well, did it make sense? Did you like it? What didn't you like? What do you think people didn't understand? And he's, will he he's giving me a gift. He's taking time to give me feedback and treat it as such. A lot of times people go, I don't want to hear feedback. It's painful. It scares me. No, no. Ask for it. You're getting a gift. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to do anything with it. But get it. Power. Give it away daily. Give it away daily. One of the things I do is when I go into a meeting, I try to figure out who has the least amount of power in a meeting, and I ask them for their opinions. What do you think? Hmm. You, be, you learn something instead of, I'm the guy in charge. Let me tell you what I think we should do. Give away power. The more you give away, the more comes back to you. Well, leaders forget. Leaders are always like, I need to maintain an air of authority. You know what? You will always get authority. People will very rarely question you. But if you give it away, you'll find you have much more success. You'll get better outcomes. You'll have happier employees than if you're constantly trying to build power. Uh, and anger. It's counterproductive, and I've witnessed this on many occasions. When things aren't going well, somebody gets mad and starts yelling. You know what? When you're mad, it's probably because something's not working and you've got a problem. And the minute you start yelling, what happens? Everybody shuts up. So at the time you need people to help you figure it out, you have just encouraged them to hide in their shells and not engage with you. Anger is the least productive thing you can have. Now, there's times you can be angry. We all do. But it has to, it's used very, very small, very, very limited. And the other problem is people will pass it on. You've all heard this. You go, I go yell at my, so I want everybody, my, I want all the employees in the company to be happy. So I go yell at my execs, my direct reports. And I expect them to turn around and be all nice and loving to their management, to their directs. No, if I yell at them, they yell at their, their, their people and they yell, and then they go home from work and they yell at the dog, right? It gets, anger goes all the way down. I want to do is I want to be nice. If I start goodness at the top, goodness permeates. Goodness, I, I don't know you, I want to work for somebody I like. I enjoy being with them. I don't want to work for somebody I'm afraid of. And then the last thing, great leaders are successful people. And this one I think is pretty simple. Uh, great leaders actually surround themselves with really successful people. Um, growth and opportunity will always come from below, not from, a top, from a, on top. I will tell you, um, I have built and sold three software companies. I have yet to ever have an original idea. All of the companies that we've had have always come from other people and their ideas, and it comes from the bottom up. This idea that SideQuest has today, it didn't come from me. I'm an empty pumpkin. It came from a lot of the smart people that were out working with the, with the clients and the opportunities. And that's where you want to be able to have that engagement and be able to draw from the bottom up. Um, this one I always like. Behold the turtle. He only makes progress when he sticks his neck out. Ever seen a turtle go anywhere when his neck's in the, in the shell? No, he doesn't go anywhere. Nothing happens. They're hiding. So what your goal is, is if you, ha if you show respect, you show trust, you don't show anger, people will stick their necks out, and that's how you build a great company. Think of the turtle next time you're dealing with a problem. Uh, inputs are coached, outputs are measured. I'll talk about that in just a second. And don't think of problems as personal. Great leaders always think of their company and employees uh, first. They never think about themselves. So our key management concepts, and I'm down to the last couple of slides here, uh, if you take everything that we think of how we manage and how we, how we uh, teach people that we want to behave inside our company, we value collaboration over consensus. We are, are, we are looking for input. We're wanting people to talk about what's right and what's wrong. But it is collaborative. It is not consensus building. Our political system today is built on consensus. And look at the problems we have. Because everybody's trying to find the middle way. We are not trying to look for consensus. What we're looking for is collaboration. Ultimately, someone is responsible and has to make a decision. 99.9% .9 of the time, the consensus is the right answer. Okay, But don't confuse consensus over collaboration. I think we've talked about the respect and trust. Facts, then opinions. We are a very fact-driven organization. Somebody says, I think we should do this. 
we spend a lot of time talking about what the facts are, not, not what the opinion is. Facts first, then opinions. Proper use and respect of power, I think we've talked about that, and focusing on the right things. Environments, incentive programs, and shareholder value. And I think that should be self-explanatory from what I talked about earlier. Um, I gave a presentation at Duke uh, Fuqua a couple of weeks ago, and somebody asked me, he said, hmm, it's kind of like a, kind of a Far Eastern culture concept you have in your management, you know, very Zen-like. I'm like, well, it's not really the idea. It wasn't, it's just what's worked. And uh, in my mind, it's a mixture of old management and leadership combined with some of the newer, newer things. And so it's a hybrid, at least in our mind. So let me talk about the principles we live by. We talk about this quite a bit. Um, and as I said, we, we teach all new employees this. So if you were to come and work at SideQuest, within the first 60 days, you'll go through new or employee orientation. And so I will sit down with you and I'll spend about 45 minutes and these are the slides I would walk you through. Uh, the first slide is we have something called the rule of Buca de Peppa. Does anyone know what Buca de Peppa is? It's a restaurant, right? The best. It's the best. You're right. It's an Italian restaurant. And actually, I ended up in a Buca di Peppa restaurant like in 2002. I was on a business trip. It was late at night. There was a team of us from the management team. We were looking for a place to eat. I walked in to the, to the receptionist and said, we, well, we want to sit down. And the lady goes, restaurant sold out. And this was like, we were hungry and we were tired. And I gave her the best puppy dog eyes I could muster. And I'm like, please, do you have any place? And she says, we have one table. It's in the kitchen. We're like, OK. So we sat there and ate in the kitchen and watched them cook. That was a phenomenal experience. If the kitchen, if the, if the restaurant is that, is that proud of the food preparation and the way their staff works, that they're willing to let you sit, into a, sit in a table in the kitchen and watch the prep cooks work, you've got to talk about they've got to have a pretty high standard. So that's one of our rules we have. Have an open kitchen. Be willing to share and show what's happening in the business. And again, this is something we're struggling with as a public company because the laws don't really want you to be public. And we're trying to figure out how do we continue this concept as we go forward. Measure outputs, not inputs. Coach inputs. Measure outputs, not inputs. Coach inputs. Well, I hear this from a lot of new employees or very young employees. I worked 57 hours last week. Hmm. That's an input. That's not an output. My question is, so what did you do for our customer? How's our customer, how's that client better? Did you make the product better? Did you make the process better for them? I worked 50, or I did this, or I did that. Now, by the way, if you're working 57 hours, maybe we need to help you. We need to coach you on how to be more effective, or how to use time management, or there's a problem. But you measure the outputs, you coach the inputs. Basketball season's coming, across, coming, up, uh, coming up fairly shortly. What do you do? You don't coach a final score. What do you coach? You coach free throws. You coach layups. You coach block shots. What are they? They are all inputs toward what you measure the final score. So if you're ever working on something and you're managing someone, ask yourself, hmm, am I measuring inputs or outputs? And am I coaching inputs or outputs? Because they're two different, two different behaviors, two different processes. Uh, third thing we teach is first the bad news. So um, anytime I have a board meeting, I start my board meeting with, okay guys, here's the bad news first. You know what, if really it's, it's do it sometime. When you start a meeting, first the bad news. Because people know there's bad news, we all know it exists out there, but if you start with it first, you'd be amazed how once you get through it, A, it's not as bad as you think it is, and B, then everybody can start to talk about it. Versus if you start with all the good news first, People are never paying attention to the good news because they're waiting for the bad news to come out. So start, first the bad news. Uh, say what needs to be said at the right time in the right way. Uh, this kind of gets back to the feedback as a gift. Um, we believe you can give feedback to anybody in the company. An employee can tell me, hmm, I didn't like that presentation, but how you do it in the right time in the right way is what's key. So if you want to give me feedback, great, I'd love to hear it. Um, at the right time, so let's not do it in front of the entire employee base, and in the right way, like, hmm, that sucked. No, let me tell you about how you could do it better. That's the concept. So even when I give feedback to my directs, I give them through that mechanism. At the right time, usually in private, and in the right way. Hmm, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? That's what I mean by this idea. Say, but, but by the way, if there's a problem, you gotta say it. You can't ignore it, because people know it. It's the elephant in the room. 
Uh, we've talked a little bit about this, say thank you. Feedback is a gift. So anytime anybody gives you feedback, the first thing you should always say is, hmm, thank you. I will tell you, I got a lot of feedback on the IPO Roadshow from investors. They wanted to tell me this is how you should run the company. And I would always go, hmm, okay, thank you. Sometimes I wanted to tell them it was a dumb idea, but I will always try to start with thank you because the fact that they're willing to take the time to tell you something, you don't have to agree with it, but treat it with respect. And if you listen to it, usually the, the feedback that's the hardest to hear is usually the most useful for you. And if you start with the, the thank you first, that gets you, that at least gets you in the mindset of beginning to think about it. Deal in facts, seek the truth. We talk a lot about that. We always were looking for what facts that we can find to help us make better decisions. Uh, focus on defining the problem. It should be 95% of the effort. By the way, again, what I, remember what I said earlier, building a company is doing nothing but solving problems. That's really what building a company is. Um, and so defining the problem is really the hardest thing to do. And a lot of people, when they have a problem, what they tend to do is spend five minutes talking about the problem and 95% talking about the solution. Why? Because problem, problems cause risk, they cause pain, they cause anxiety. People are worried about a problem. And so they don't want to spend so much time talking about it. They want to hurry up and get to the, to the solution because that feels better, right? Making the problem go away, making us feel better about it. And I find as a good leader, if you can be very comfortable talking about the problem with people, hmm, so we've really messed this up. Why? Why do we know? What could we have done about it? What caused the problem? How is the client? You spend a lot of time figuring out what the problem is. The solution actually becomes very easy. If you spend a little time focusing on the problem and all the time on the solution, a lot of times you're solving the wrong problem because people want to get to that, that comfort spot. Uh, these last two slides focused on the journey, not the destination. This was really applicable when we did the Take Private. Um, when I walked into SciQuest in 2001, I was asked repeatedly, what are you going to do with the company? The rumors inside of SciQuest in February was I had been hired to sell the business. And my answer was, this has been my answer since day one. We are focusing on the journey. We're focusing on building a great company that services our shareholders, our employees, and our customers really, really well. That's all we're going to focus on. We're not going to focus on how do we build this company up to sell it to Oracle or how do we build this company up to go public because you know what? The minute you start focusing on that goal, you lose the opportunity to do other things. You make decisions focused entirely on that goal. And that goal may not be the best goal for you. If we had started in 2001 with the goal of we want to build this company and sell it to Oracle, and let's say in 2004 Oracle didn't care about this technology space, what would have happened? Where do you go from there? You're in problems. But if you focus on how do I build a really great company that has value and has great returns, you can do anything. You can sell it, you can IPO it, you can recap it. There's a lots of options. But focusing on the journey, not the destination. Uh, and the last piece here, trust and respect are key ingredients in success. You have to give it before you earn it, and they simplify all interactions. If you've ever seen a contract between parties that don't respect and trust each other, the, pay, the contract is usually hundreds of pages of law. If you trust someone and you have respect and you believe you're both going to do the right things, you know what? The contract gets a lot simpler. And I will tell you, that's the interaction we have with all of our, with, with our clients, with our business, as we run the company. Our, we are always trying to give respect and always trying to give trust. Now, by the way, there are people in life you will, re, you will learn that will, you cannot trust. But let's deal with them on the exception, not the rule. Give it? You'll always get it back. We, ha we have great customer sat, and that's because we, we earn our salary every day, and we have to deliver value. And if we're not delivering value, we need to recognize it, and we need to correct it and find a way to deliver value. And if you do that, clients will be references for each other, and it really helps the company grow. Any other questions? I'm down probably beyond my time. Okay. Thank you for your time.